Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome today to Reimagining the Future, Unlocking a New Era of Travel for the Indian Market. I can start by simply saying to all of you, India, 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 these days, everybody's talking about the Indian market. It's great to know the way it is booming and the way things are going, going ahead. To begin with, I just want to mention to you that before the pandemic, the Indian domestic market was at about 1.75 billion. That was the numbers we were talking about. And now the way it is going, we all expect it to cross the 2 billion mark. That's what basically will happen at the moment. Outbound from India, well, if some of the pundits say that it should cross about 40 million, because before 2019, it was about 30 million. And that's what basically is happening. Big challenge for all of us is that you can't get seats anywhere. You go to any plane, you go, go on a train, you want to go into a hotel, there are no rooms available. Today, everyone, every airline, every hotel is charging amounts which are unbelievable. In fact, what I used to pay to coming to Dubai, uh, maybe before the pandemic, was one third the cost what I'm paying today. Similarly with domestic hotels in India. And if I can safely say, which I'm going to ask my panelists a little later, uh, I, could, could be wrong, I couldn't be wrong, but I think I will safely say that it's cheaper for me to holiday abroad than holiday in India, comparing apples to apple, five-star hotel to a five-star hotel. So if I look at that, it's a total different market size. So anyway, we're going to look at what's the reimagining of the future. Let's see how we can unlock it for with Indians. And we have two expert panelists among us. Uh, one is Matthew Sinner, right over here on my left. He's head of tourism for MacArthur Glen Group. Welcome, uh, Matthias. It's good to have you here. And then Thank I have you. next to him is Naveen Kundu, who's the managing director of Ebix Cash Travel Group. And I can safely say for him, I have known him for many years and the way he's grown. Congratulations to you, Naveen. That's, that's been brilliant. So we're going to hear a lot of things from you today. But before I go to you, I'll start with Matthias. Matthias, you have seen India from a different perspective. So before I ask you to start with anything, I want to look you to look into the, your crystal ball and tell us how, did the re, uh, how does the future look like? How would you reimagine it the way it is going to be? What's your thoughts on that? Well, I think, you know, if you, if you look at the future, there are a lot of challenges, but also a lot of opportunities. And I think it's fair to say that the pandemic had a quite profound impact on all of us, on our lives, on tourism. And um, it was definitely one of the most disruptive events of this century. Um, the challenge now is that some of the short-term implications we saw, you know, are still there. So during the pandemic, we had a lot of travel restrictions, which are now mostly gone. Uh, we had a lot of lack in confidence in travel, especially internationally, a lot of lack of infrastructure, a lot of seat availability. And many of these things and limitations are still ongoing, right? So like you rightly said, um, the tourism infrastructure domestically and globally is still not where it used to be in 2019. What we now see, though, is that the demand is coming back quite aggressively from India specifically. And we see a lot of demand into Europe, but we also see that the flight capacity is not where it used to be. The staffing in Europe and for the travel infrastructure is not where it used to be. A lot of people moved out of tourism during the pandemic, and it's very hard now to fill back uh, the, the, the staffing. And as a result, travel has become immensely costly. Like, if you look at the flight, of, the flight costs, for example, I mean, I've been going to India for many years now. The last time I went, the price was nearly double what it used to be for the similar product, exactly everything the same. And I think especially when it comes to, um, you know, now coming out of the pandemic, I mean, we have the demand, we have the willingness to go out, and revenge travel definitely is still a thing. But this will not last forever. And I think the second the revenge travel piece will become less and less, people will become more selective again. They will become more price conscious. Okay, let us just hang on to this thought because I want to come back to you a little later. But uh, as an introduction, Mark, uh, Naveen, I'm going to ask you. During the pandemic, after the pandemic, let's hear the India story. Because today when you talk about when Matthew says the prices of flights are high, we don't get a seat. 
it's impossible to get a seat. So that's what's basically happening. So, so what's your take on this? Well, how do you look at that? So Sanjeet, uh, thank you for having me here on this panel. I'll tell you very clearly that you first have to understand the India story to really, you know, and you have to, you have to digest the macroeconomic structure and fabric of our country to figure out why we are who we are. You know, you have to understand out of the total output economic, economic output of the world today, 400 billion is what is generated by India mm -hmm. in 2023, will be generated in India by 2023, and it will be 800 billion between now and 2031. In 2028, it will be a $500 billion output. Mm -hmm. If you see today's report of IMF, IMF said, between India and China, the growth will be driven of the world at 4.6%, and India will grow at a minimum 65 to 7%, when all other global economies are shrinking, some to the recession levels. India is, Indian economy is very immune to the world standards now. You know, there is nothing that uh, bothers India today because of the entire regulatory system that Indian economy has put in place. Today, India is immune to the economic slowdown of the world, whether it was 2008 or whether it is the inflation and the recession in the current times, India is immune to all of that. We're still growing. Indian urbanization is fast happening. Mm -hmm. You know, it was unheard of in India that some households will cross an income barrier of per capita income of $35,000 a household. Today, 25 million Indian population has family income of over $35,000 and in 2027, 28, it'll be 50 million people having an income of thirty-five dollars to $50,000 per household income. Mm -hmm. That shows how strong our demographics are. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, India now is the highest populated country in the world. Only a week back, we became the largest population of the world. But while it may not be a great news for, the, for some, it's a great news for me because as an Indian, I see that we are an economy which has the consumer base. Mm -hmm. So we can practically consume any kind of product today in the world, whether it is an economic product, a budget product, or a super luxury product. India is a market for one and all. Mm -hmm. If you see Mithais as your country, as your, as your business, the reason you're looking at India is because you feel that India has a potential. Definitely, yes. And it has large potential. So with all the macroeconomic you know indicators are indicating that today India is going to lead the way that the global economy will be driven and I think it's a good point because you know when you've come to India for many years you now really things changing significantly you see the tourism infrastructure outbound into Europe being built to a different level Tier 2 cities, Tier 3 cities now get direct connections. Let me tell you, India is the only country in the world which is laying down 38 kilometers per day of road, mm -hmm. 1.9 kilometers of rail network per day, mm -hmm. and we are going to be adding one airport every three months over the next three years. One airport every three months. Like, give me a reason. Give me a, give me a number. Any country is coming close to us. So we are going to be a dominating nation. Yeah, and like you say, I mean, you build the airports now and Air India is expanding massively, right? And they need the planes to fill both regional and international routes for the future because the demand is clearly there. So the question Sanjeet asked me was about the rising airfares and we don't still get a seat. Mm -hmm. uh, India is right now uh, considered to be the third largest aviation market of the world after mm -hmm. America and China. In India, currently, we have only 860 planes. But our market size today demands 2,000 planes. Mm -hmm. The reason what Sanjeet said is that we don't get a, you know, while the airfares are rising and we don't get a seat, is because as a nation, we've changed. We, you know, sometimes back, world would not give us a bargain and India would not buy without a bargain. Mm -hmm. But today, Indians are just about, just about in a position to sort of, consume anything as I told you and that's because of the macroeconomic fabric of this country that has been laid exactly. in the last 10-15 years. Yeah. So, so what you're saying is that let's look at because of the growth part this is going to be 
something which is going to be very different. So it's going to affect tourism in a big way. But I, I just hang on. I'm going to come back to you. But I just want to go. Matthias, when you mentioned that kind of situation, the airfares had doubled the services were mm -hmm. the same and all that. Now, for example, in, today in India, we have approximately 60 different tourism boards who are operationing in India. So that means they're looking at the basic Indian traveler to come to their destination. And that's what basically is happening. The other countries, now you, since you look after the world, you're, you're, you're a tourism expert of globally. Now, when you look at the globe kind of situation, what is your take on the Indian market? Where do you think so is going? What's going to really happen? Because you have traveled, well, he's traveled length and breadth of the country. So I thought, let me get some experience from you, some ideas. Where do you think so India is going to be heading for? And how do you look at it? Well, like Naveen said, I mean, it's it's growing. No, to, to this point of view, I'm not yeah, going no, on the... No, 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 no. <laughs> it's, it's growing. It's grow, it's growing massively. And I think this is also one of the reasons why there are so many companies and industries looking at India right now. Because there's a lot of power in the market. I think a lot of people in the past are always saying India will become the next China. I think that's the wrong way of looking at it. India will become the new India. And there's a lot of growth potential... And, and a lot of opportunity. For us as a business, you know, we, we are designer outlets. And like you say, Indians love to shop. And you know, the stronger the economy, the stronger and more constant the economic development, the more wealth creation. And as a result, people want to travel. People get international passports. People you know, don't want to only travel regionally and locally. They want to get out of the country. They want to buy their next Gucci bag in Milan and not you know, in Delhi. And I think this is what we are seeing. We see a strong demand from India into Indian customers, into Europe. And, you know, we know Indians love discounts. They love luxury products. And that's where MacArthur Glen plays a crucial role. And that's why we are so interested in the market right now. And, you know, the best part is the way Indian economy is going, we will end up paying for the Gucci bag in Indian rupees in Milan very soon. We don't need to exchange our dollars. And that's the revolution of our current currency that's happening in India. That, that started. That's, that's well started at the moment. That's, that's very well said. But Naveen, tell me one thing. Today, when you, when you look at a hotel, for example, most of the hotels you're paying 30,000, 40,000 rupees. And if you, at least I'm talking about leisure destinations, you go to a place like Jaipur, I don't know, stay in the palace and stuff like that, you're talking about $100,000. That's $1,200 a night. And people are paying. My, my point is, where does this money suddenly come from? And why are, the, why are they traveling like this? Like revenge is one part of it. But paying this kind of fares, which, which are money which India's never paid. Earlier you could get a hotel for 10, 12,000 rupees and people would say, oh my God, that's a lot. And today, so where, what's happening? Where's this change coming from? Digitization. You know, I don't want to be sounding like a, uh, like a political analyst here, but let me tell you, the 2016 demonetization has to be appreciated for what has happened to the, to the cultural shift that's happened in India in terms of paying capacities. India used to be a parallel economy, largest parallel economy of the world. But today, 86% of our money is moving digitally. That's the, kind of, that's the kind of impact that has happened in this country. Look at the UPI. Every minute, every second, we have 2,438 transactions. We move 140 billion worth of transaction every day on a UPI platform. 13 countries have come and signed an agreement that they would want to replicate this model in their own country. So you have to understand this money was always there. It was always growing. But it's now being spent through an official digital platform. So people don't mind paying because they want to consume. And, and you know, uh, look at, and you have to also understand, a lot of this money comes through corporate spending. Mm -hmm. you know, when I say corporate spending, I don't just say corporate, large corporates. I say I want to spend money. Today, the corporate tax in India has been revised from 35% to 25%. And I'm allowed to put all expenditure in the, in the company. So, so I start a private limited company. I register myself as a private limited company. I'm an entrepreneur. I'm doing transactions. I'm, I'm doing business. I'm going to pay for those hotels through my company. Mm -hmm. Because it gives me a tax benefit. Okay, and well taken, but that's corporate travel and talking about mice. But I know that's what you're an expert on. But when it comes to leisure also, the point is the kind of rates they're charging. And because that means earlier people had this money, what you're saying is in cash, and they wanted to hoard it. They didn't want to spend it, and now they want to spend it. They didn't want to come in public eye to be spending everywhere. But now since the move, money is moving digitally, it's all in the official records. So people are spending. 
Not that people didn't spend that kind of money before Sanjeev. I have seen a cultural shift of people. Let me tell you, when I started, and, and you were a witness to it, I mean, I know you since 1992. Uh, in India, when people would go abroad, how many people would stay in a Marriott or a Hyatt or a, or a luxury hotel? Very few people. They would stay in individually owned hotels. Mm -hmm. Look at the cultural shift what has happened. Today, Indians spend, are the largest spenders. You go to any branded hotel in the world, any time of the year, you will spot Indian people there. Yeah. Look at what has happened to the weddings market. 10 million weddings. And all, all happening in the hotels. Yeah, but like Naveen is saying, the market has become much more sophisticated also in, in the travel. There's a complete cultural shift. Yeah. No, it has changed. I'm, I'm not even debating that. Everybody uh, today, sir, today, one minute, Sanjit, I want to add to you. In 1992, you were there and I was there. How many tourism boards were in India? How many international chains were in India? Correct. I set up the first, you know, global sales office for Best Western in India, if you remember. We did right. an agreement True. with your magazine of a front, front page cover. Look at the shift from there to now. Every hotel chain has set up a global sales office. 60 tourism boards are in India. The, today, even the, sh who had, I had not even imagined in my life that there'll be company like, a, like his coming to India and targeting Indian customers and setting a base in India. Mm -hmm. it, is, it was unheard of. Yeah, so, so this is a cultural shift is, 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 has taken place. Okay, Naveen, uh, Mathis, I'll just come back to you later. Uh, since you're on this topic, I really want to ask you, <coughs> everybody talks about the booming market, everything is happening today. And if I may ask you, it's cheaper to holiday for me abroad than in India. A five-star hotel to a five-star hotel, I may get something at $150. Okay, let's not take Dubai, some of the expensive hotels. But if I look at Southeast Asia and other places, for $150, $200, I can get a great hotel, a good hotel, a good deal going. And if I were to convert that into 15,000 to 16,000 rupees, I won't even get a St. Regis in Mumbai. So what I'm going to say to you is, it's, it's become more expensive to holiday in India and abroad than compared to abroad. And is that a reason people are traveling abroad and things of those kind and not? Because the Indian hotels are also doing full. So I'm not able to defer that's the further that where the whole thing is happening. Is this market going abroad? It is going to be in India, but everything is full. So what's happening? Indians have matured in travel. So I, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not really going to compare what's, got, what's it going to cost in India or what's going to cost abroad because I run a company across the world. So, so for me, it's, it's, a group, it's a great situation to be in today that I have people consuming my products in India and people consuming my products overseas. But as I said, it's a complete, as, as, as Matthias said, it's a sophistication has come in mm. to travel. So people don't really mind spending now. And pandemic has further taught them that, look, coffin does not have a pocket. Yeah, but when you say the cost coffin doesn't have a pocket. So, you, so whatever you earn, spend it here because you're not going to take it with you. And so there is a, there's, so it's a, it's a, it's a blend of cultural shift. It's a blend of what you see in yourself as a future, how you see your future. It's a blend of what you want to do with your life. Today, Indian economy, which used to be a saving economy once upon a time, has become a consuming economy. So it's a straightforward fact that they will, they will, they will move as per their preferences and choices. It is not necessary that they will only have brought outside or not in India. India is a market for every, every hotel, whether in India or outside. It's a clear indication now. So what you're saying is price is no more a consideration. Yeah. It's it's the service and where and what the name you can. It is the preference. What you want, what you want is what you get. All right, but that's that's great news and for you, Matthew. And, yeah? and I think also you need to say that the the international luxury hotel scene in India is still, you know, in its infancy. There's still a lot of development potential, especially in the big cities. So the price of luxury hotels is also driven by by the supply. So I think, you know, you, if you compare India to other countries, then the luxury hotel density, especially from international hotel brands, is still not as sophisticated and big as in other cities. So if you go to Mumbai, like you say, you know, you have the St. Regis, you maybe have a Mandarin Four Seasons, and then you have a couple of Indian brands. But you have very little really big, you know, Ritz-Carlton. I mean, if you look at Bangalore, for example, I think it's probably the Indian city with the biggest density of luxury international hotel brands yet. And I think there's a big development opportunity for the hotel industry, especially in the big capitals. And this is what we will see over the next years. 
We are only meeting 20% of our occupancy demands in India, right? Hotel, hotel demand in India. Mm -hmm. So if India needs, if India, if, you know, today, we have just about 20% capacity mm -hmm. that, that is available to us. Mm -hmm. So the supply is inadequate. Mm -hmm. We have to, we have, we have 80% is the growth expected of the hospitality industry mm -hmm. over the next five, seven years. And mm -hmm. primarily the most of this is going to be driven by the industrial chains. And that is what will bring our FDI. So today, if you look at the FDI that's coming into India, 25% of it will come in the form of hospitality and tourism. Mm -hmm. So those who are in the tourism industry are good, right? So everybody who's sitting here, you can clap for yourselves. You're in the right business at the right time. That's what really makes a big difference. As I always say, Indian market will never disappoint you. Okay. Um, I can agree. Okay, Mathis, I'm going to ask you something, which is, I'm going to take you back into something different, because when you came into the Indian market, it was very different. And you have actually, if I may use the word, uh, revolutionized, revolutionized the whole system of, of, of selling in, in terms of, not just in terms of uh, uh, to, to the agents, to the customer, and getting the luxury customer to coming to you. What is your future plan and strategy and your approach which is going to be going forward? Because you're a new, see, I'm, maybe you're a, MacArthur Glen is an old product in different countries, but from India, you're brand new. You're, you're something you're creating which is very much different and it is a revolution, definitely. No, and, and I agree. I think India was a market we were looking at for a long time. Uh, we were always trying to figure out how to approach it in the best way. And during the pandemic, we identified India as a mid, short, mid and long term, big growth opportunity for our business. As a result, we went into the market to really promote the concept of luxury outlet shopping to, to Indian travelers to Europe. And what we've seen, obviously, is there's a lot of demand for what we are offering as MacArthur Glen. Um, but we're just getting started. I mean, it's a process going into a new market, no matter how many markets you've opened before, you know, every market is unique. Every market has unique characteristics and traits. And for us, we can't approach it one size fits all. So when we talk about India, we are still, I have to say, to be really honest, in a learning curve. So we've made, I think, some great inroads in the first one and a half years in the market to position the brand, to raise awareness for the outlet shopping concept. But I think we are just getting started. And we see that both travel trade as well as customers have a lot of interest in what we have to offer. Because like you, know, you said, Indians love to consume, they love to shop. Um, we know as MacArthur Glen, they love a good discount along the way. So the outlet concept, luxury outlet concept, works very well in the Indian market. And then it's really about kind of continuously growing your network of partners in the market, continuously integrating yourself with the right players in the market, raise brand awareness and create bookable products, you know, work with the big operators in the market, the Thomas Cooks, Make My Trips, to really position MacArthur Glen as a key part of the European shopping itinerary, uh, travel itinerary, and make shopping a key part of that. And that's so far something that worked very well and we've been very successful with. But we're just getting started. You're getting started at the right time because Indians have this habit uh, if you're traveling abroad, you can't go back home without buying a gift for the family. Uh, they'll lock you out of the house. So it's something which is, which is, which is required. But uh, Naveen, what he just mentioned, and I'm going to ask you on this is, though he did mention this is going to be for some time, but is this a passing phase? You think because people want to now travel and Indians are spending that kind of money, like you said, they don't have pockets or graves. But the point is, what do you think so? Where will this end or will this continue for all times to come? I'll quote you a figure. You know, I've just downloaded something. Indian outbound tourism market is projected to reach an estimated $16 million in 2023 and will get to $45,000 million by 2030. Now, if you call it a passing phase, I don't know what reality is. The reality is that it is going to be India's century. We all know and what is the basis to it? The basis to it is, long back, we were ridiculed and critiqued as a nation of too much population and an underdeveloped infrastructure. So it was a weakness and a threat. We converted the weakness of population into a strength and we converted the infrastructure threat as an opportunity. So all the money that's coming into India for development, 
you know, let me give you a figure. In 75 years of our independence, the total FDI that has come into India is $950 billion. But $532 billion came in the last nine years. One. The money came across 63 sectors and it went to all 31 states and union territories. India produces five, five million graduates every year with 1.6 million engineers. The figure does not, you know, US and, America, US and Europe put together does not even have 200,000 engineers a year. Now, why am I saying the impact is because all these people who are going to be, who are, who are nurtured in India, when people were, when the world was building brands, India was training its people and educating its people to go and manage those brands. And if you see, 250 out of 500 companies in the world have Indian CEOs and CXOs. Where is, so why am I connecting this? The, the reason is it's not a passing phase. All these people have jobs outside. All the FDA that's coming inside the country. It's all becoming an economic enabler. And, the, and this is going to continue for this whole century. We are the second largest English speaking nation to the world. Today, ease of doing business in India has created, has, is going to create India as the manufacturing and the, and, the, and the factory to the world. We are the business process outsourcing hub to the world. All that money, everything is happening in India. So it's not a passing phase at all. No, I agree. Okay. You have been throwing a lot of fact figures to all us, all of us, right? Now, now let's come to, come to basic That's reality. reality. Now, okay. Let's, let's keep the economy aside. Oh, great. Economy is good. It, it takes you, it gets you into tourism. It's got more money with disposable income. People can do things. All right. Well taken. Now, let's come to the basic part about the travel part of it, right? Now, what we're saying is we are in a good position at the moment. Inbound domestic is doing very well. Uh, outbound is doing very well kind of situation. Inbound hopefully now it will pick up as we go along because the infrastructure is there, but pricing may be a, a big question mark we need to look at. But now for a travel agency point of view, now let, let's get down to the basic part of it. The hotels are the principles, the airlines of course are the principles. Now, where do these guys fit in? Because there's so much happening at the moment. You have the OTAs, you have the agencies, some of them are doing big business, some are not. But you have the mum and shop, pop shops also who are doing well. So, so what's going to happen over here? Everybody will exist. Look, uh, if you look at the IATA commissions, what they were 20 years back and what they are today, there's no comparison. Hotel commissions are front. People are spending more distribution, more money on distribution, whether it's hotels or airlines, to penetrate to every last mile. But have they eliminated any agency or any OTA? No, they have not. They cannot. It's an ecosystem which will support the, which is, we, so supply will enhance demand, demand will create more supply. And brick and mortar model will remain as much as an online model will remain. It's not going to happen that you're going to be eliminating brick and mortar model of mom and pop shops completely. That will never happen. Mm -hmm. What will happen is the travel trend will change. Mm -hmm. from, from earlier times when group travel used to be a very large, group leisure travel mm -hmm. used to be a very large uh, part of the business in India. It will now be more FIT and family driven. Mm -hmm. People will get more mature traveling on their own rather than traveling in groups. So there will be a slight shift in the buying preference. But if you say that mom and pop shop will not exist and only online will exist, no, that's not correct. Mm -hmm. Even the online people are now targeting the online shops and, and trying to give them technology. So technology becomes their enabler. Yeah. But, but no company, unless they come into huge debt, and fortunately for India, more than travel companies, it is the airlines chatting every now and then. You understand? So, so I don't see that the Indian travel market will only exist online or offline. Mm. It'll be a blend of both. It'll not, it'll not, it's not going to be that something, some overnight shift will happen and only all mom and pop shops and brick and mortar shops will close down. That's not going to happen. Naveen, very well said when you're saying this, but please understand 
uh, when it comes to the younger generation, you're talking about technology and stuff like that. There are lots of them who just want to go on their phones. They can do whatever business they want to. But when it comes to your talk about uh, mom and pop shops, they're looking at service. They need to go sit down with them and they know if anything goes wrong, who's neck to catch. So, so my point is, but, but now with the younger generation, the education, everything on the phone, will that survive? You think they have a chance? 100% will survive. I'll tell you what. I'll just give you an example. The concept of YOLO, you only live once, has set in everywhere. Millennials want everything on the phone. But you know what is happening is when they, when, when, when they, when they mature in life, when they become graduates and move on and become a family, then they still want to sit with their next door travel agent and plan a holiday between three or four families and say, look, we don't want to get into this hassle of, of, of every time tracking confirmation numbers, going with our phones. We need to be greeted in a place as we arrive. We need to be greeted by the hotels. We need to pre-plan everything and pre-book everything. So there go, there's going to be a little bit of a tweaking of the business models, yeah. which, which people will have to do, but, but everybody will remain. Because the market is so large, Prasenji, the market is huge. And also the service in, part. In India, in India, I can tell you, or unorganized travel market is still bigger than the organized travel market. Let me give you an example of MICE. Now, MICE doesn't only mean corporate group. It also means distribution group. The market size is 50,000 crores plus as we speak today. But only about five, 6,000 crores is moved by the travel agencies and, and all the platforms. A lot of buying is still happening directly. But they don't want to. They want pe the people have to be reached out to. So the concept of tier two, tier three, three or four cities. You see, India used to be a market of five cities sometimes back. Yeah, that's, Today, that's India is a market of 100 cities. So in those 100 cities, <coughs> it is a coming up. Okay, fair enough. Mathis, I know you've been sitting quite sorry for too long, but I had to yeah, deliver a few facts. Uh, but but now, now, keeping in mind, you, you understood the Indian market, you've seen the Indian market, you've seen the Middle East market, uh, you've seen Southeast Asia happening, uh, you've seen China, the way it's matured, the way it was going. Now. Do you find that we are fitting in any pattern or this is a natural thing which happened with every market? Maybe Southeast Asia followed this whole thing or are we progressing in a particular thing or are we are jumping? I mean, it's probably happening quicker than in other countries for sure. I think the, the backbone of what we are now seeing in terms of tourism development is the economy. And you see that the economy is driving, is growing rapidly. It's very resilient. It's, it's kind of in comparison, like Naveen was saying, India is very strong and consistently strong. And that is really fueling the growth that will come and will come quicker than in other countries. I think at the moment, you still just have the limitating factors like airline capacity, which is definitely not fit for demand yet. But the second this will change, and over the next years with the you know, investments of Air India with the infrastructure developments, you will open up the gates or you will open the gates for Indians to really, you know, grow at a different speed than what we have seen so far at different, you know, rates. And I think basically the pattern is economic development. This is where India fits right in. It just happens quicker and more aggressively than what we've seen in other countries so far. Yeah. I want to ask you is because Indians are all of us in the whole Indian, they're all used to service. Even a middle class family or the upper or the others, they all, we all get help in the house. It, even if it's somebody who comes and cleans your home or so everybody's used to help. Now, when we go abroad kind of situation, a lot of people don't understand this. And especially uh, when, when they're looking at services at, at restaurants and, uh, and maybe at outlets and all that. So are you looking at doing something specific for the Indian market from the service angle? Well, well yeah, I think, you know, it's one thing to, to try to get a lot of customers into your business or into your country. But you also need to be, you know, aware of the cultural needs and the, you know, the... Um, you know what works what doesn't work i think that again that for europe because i don't think that europe at this point or globally probably is ready yet and is at that stage and i think this will be a natural development the more indian travelers we will see across the world destinations especially those that are famous with indian customers they will need to learn it maybe sometimes the hard way but you know eventually if they are really serious about attracting Indian customers and developing them and the numbers long term. They need to adapt. Hotels need to adapt. Services need to adapt. You know, facilities need to adapt. 
And this is crucial because otherwise, I think it's not sustainable. And you will see that maybe some destinations might be very quick in attracting Indian travelers, but if they don't try to understand them, they will lose the interest of the Indian customers. And this is so important that we have a sustainable approach from destinations to attract and develop Indian uh, travelers over the long run, not just with the short-term focus. Look, but I'll tell you, Bhattas, a lot of this, this is being done by a lot of countries, including European countries. If you see, 18 out of 30 countries in Europe have signed an MOU mm -hmm. that they will start e-visas from India. See, today the biggest challenge for Indians is to visa. get an appointment yeah. for visa. And what, so unfortunately, the, the, pan, the way pandemic has impacted Europe in terms of its uh, delivery of services, it's not happened in India. India mm -hmm. has actually grown and evolved from there. Mm -hmm. Because uh, I don't want to get into the details, details who handled pandemic better than the other. In India, we really handled it well. Mm -hmm. A lot of people, we also lost a lot of people in India from tourism industry to the other industries. Mm -hmm. But gradually, they're all coming back. Because tourism is in is a passion, right? But to, answer, to, to what you said, that a lot of countries will have to step up their efforts in terms of you know, attracting Indian travelers. The, the biggest reason is Europe is now, as a continent, stepping up and saying, look, if we want to have Indian travelers and if we want to get a pie of that spending into India, we need to have online visas. Yeah. So 18 countries have signed the agreement already that they will have an online visa and the biometrics to your surprise would happen at the airport rather than happening at the at the VFS centers and I'm not talking too low I'm not talking uh, a century down the line I'm talking two years down the line this will be a reality agree so that be uh, the, the, the world has to now learn the way Indians are and they need to look at that okay I was holding one question for the end Naveen and I want to really ask you now let's look at the future maybe the way things are going and let's talk about reality airlines they don't give you commissions, right? They've withdrawn the whole thing. Hotels, the way they are going kind of situation, the way they treat some of the travel agencies and all that, you know how the commissions are going, is really going down kind of situation. And if the agencies are, if the agencies are not paid, they don't get the aviation money, they don't get the hotels money, <laughs> some of them are dappling with that whole charging extra money to the clients for servicing them and all that. Where does, where this, where will this industry go? Who's going to share, Sherpa them around to make sure that this is the way you survive? See, I'll tell you, uh, when a market matures, transparency sets in. So Indian market is maturing at a very rapid pace. So transparency will set in, which means a consumer will know that the price of the product that I'm buying is X, but I'm paying a fee of 3.5 to 4.5 to 5.5% on top of it, and I'm getting service for it. So when markets mature, this shift will automatically happen. It happens in every industry. If you witness any industry, when the market matures, the, the shift happens from a, you know, markup model to a transparency model. Mm -hmm. And travel industry is no differentiation. They will also follow the same thing. So the Sherpa is going to be, I expect Sherpa to be media like you. I expect Sherpa to be the travel associations in India who will continuously campaign for for. For, for putting a mechanism in place, a council in place, a regulatory in place to educate travel people, saying that, look, come on a service charge platform. And that will happen over a period of a few years. It's already happening. No, but keeping in mind the Indian mentality, sorry, I shouldn't say that, we are part of it. But the point is, the way they will haggle and discount for even 50 rupees kind of situation, and they shift agencies, you know that. If somebody's giving you something cheaper, they'll move across kind of situation. Now, if with that mindset, I understand, but they don't want to, none of them want to give you, give you any money for, because sometimes some of the agents I know say, all right, if you come for an inquiry, I'll charge you a thousand rupees. And if you come back with the, buying the business from me, I'll reduce it. But people are not even prepared to do that. You know, Sajid, you'll be surprised to know that our bargaining power has been more highlighted in the world, but it's not like that. We also do inbound in our company. And it is the same happening worldwide now. Every agency in India who is getting in business and in incoming, every every global operator is fighting for two to three dollars. It's it's about it's about the 
mechanism of making money, the pricing factor, people will demand discounts, but they will happily pay you a charge for your business. It's just a matter of time when markets will mature. No, but if this becomes what you're suggesting is, it's going to be a vo volume game because you're talking about such le less percentages and all that. So if it becomes a volume game, then the biggies will survive. What happened to the mom and chop shops? That's, that's the other sad part of they it. They will not survive on their own. I will give you an example of companies in India that they pick up a target of 100 crores from an airline to get 3 or 4% extra, but that target is not achieved by them alone through their consumer base. They need every large, medium, small agency to come and support them. Correct. So, it, so there, will be, there will be a market of consolidation. There will, yes. be a market, there will be a market of progression. There will be a market of service charge. It's going to be a blend of everything because the market is so big. Let me tell you, even today, there is, there is very minimal penetration in a three, four tier city in India. No, so what you're suggesting is that between the principal and the agency, there's going to be an intermediary over there who, who will be your big consolidators from whom you're going to buy and sell. So ultimately, that's the way you be want to look because at of the, future? Because, because, of the, because of the financial capital aspect of it. The mom and shop, pop shop will not invest. See, if, if, you, if you go into the uh, micro structure of this, IATA has come out with a rule that earlier, I, whatever your bank guarantee was, that was not a indicator that how many tickets can you issue. Your capping was based on your entire business volume that an agency would generate and bank guarantee was just a part of it. Today, you cannot issue a ticket more than the amount of your bank guarantee with the ad. It's very as simple as that. You understand? So financial capital will come into place. So some people will aggregate the capital through a mediator, invest in him, he will pick up the contract and then it will be, it will be. So, so it's, it's very similar to what's happening, what's happened in America. America was the first market where commissions were eradicated from the system. But America is the largest consolidation market and aggregated market because of all this. So we have to wait and see who fits this midway between the whole thing. All right. Okay. We are really out of time now because, but I thought I, I'm going to ask uh, Mathis, I'll, I'll come to you a little later on that. Now, You've heard and seen what, what you've heard some things, see the amount of facts and figures he's thrown on us. Uh, what, are, what are you looking at kind of situation? Did you expect India, this is the way you expected India to be kind of situation since we're talking about India and the future? How do you look at it going forward? I mean, for us, India is still a small market, right? Um, if I compare it to other markets which have a bigger share of business for us, I know that India has huge growth potential. It's not there yet, but it will happen. It will happen very quickly, like we said, very aggressively. So I think, you know, in, in the next two, three, four years, you will see that India will become a much more dominant face on the global tourism stage. You know, you see the developments happening now. Some of them will just take a little longer, but the demand is there, the capital is there, the, the desire is there, the economic power is there. It's all clear indicators that the next step that will happen will be a big boom. And I think India has been on the verge of achieving that for a long time. Many people have always thought, spoken about India being the next big boom market, and it hasn't happened yet. But I think now we are at a point where everything is very clearly pointing in that direction. And I would with big confidence say, unless something happens that we, are, we can't foresee right now, that India is on a clear tra trajectory going up and becoming one of the top three, four, massive tourism um, uh, nations globally. I mean, if we talk about 50 million people, then India would already be number five in the global stage. And 50 million people, if you compare it to China, which 2019 had roughly 150 million uh, travelers, you know, you see how, what amount of growth potential there is. And I don't think 150 million for China even was the end of the game. So you can see how we will, the numbers, how they will grow and how they will multiply in a very short time. And this is a great opportunity for many destinations, but it's also a big challenge because handling these amounts of additional tourists in the ecosystem, you know, we already struggle to do, to handle the volumes we are facing right now. So there needs to be a lot of development in the infrastructure, you know, employment, you know, you need to build a lot new facilities, hotels, airports, 
You need to get a lot of new airlines in place. You, you really need to be able to service that demand and that will take time. So while everything is pointing in a clear direction, there are still some limiting factors I, that will not change overnight. I will add to this. When Airbus and Boeing will set up the assembly line in India, mm -hmm. when they will set up the 20,000 crore plant in Gujarat, mm -hmm. you will see, and, and I'm telling you, and sitting here over the next two, three years, one day on this ATM we'll be discussing that India has become an Asia Pacific hub far you know by far by numbers beating dubai singapore abu dhabi and qatar let me tell you it's time for all these countries to revisit their strategy because india is going to be the next global aviation hub of asia mark my words we'll be sitting down in the next 2 3 years in the same room talking about the the aviation hub shift of from in, of of all other you know eliminating all other and making india as the biggest hub. I mean, thank you. In fact, uh, but I was, I was going to say to Mathis, thanks for the confidence. I love the confidence you have about India, but you overtook that definitely kind of situation. Uh, Naveen, last word is yours. Uh, a lot of people do compare us to like different things like China and others, but they were over things which they did were there was group travels. There were a different controlled kind of travel. In India, everyone is a king. Everybody wants to travel in his own way and his own space. So going forward, what's your take that how is it going to be the future looking like for you for Indians? See, Indian, in, in, as I told you, India, you have, to, you have to, again, I go back to my words, India is the second largest English-speaking nation of the world. So it will not be a ma market like a China. It will, it will be an independent market. It will be an independent traveler's market. And let me tell you, this is where the blend will come. The whole world will look at China differently and India differently. They will not look at India and China together with the same lens. They will look at it differently. So if Matthias wants a pie of a of a global of a Chinese market, his strategy will be different. And if he wants Indian market, his strategy will be different. For sure. So so that is that will remain. So but as I said, 150 million travelers to 50 million travelers. China is huge. No, no, I agree. Anyway, I'm really out of time now. I really can't take this anymore. But I, I love the confidence that both of you have is going up going forward saying India, India, India. Best look forward to it and we'll Keep at it and make sure that it happens. Guys, can you Thank give you. them a big hand of applause, please? Thank India, you very much. It is India's century. Oh. So stand up and take a bow saying <laughs> India has arrived. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Thank, thanks a lot. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. you.